Hello, I'm Chase Oliver, and this is Gay Dixie, and uh, I just got back last night from an amazing show. My ears are still kind of ringing, and uh, it was a birthday show, and uh, my brother took me out to a concert. It was for The Offspring, uh, Bad Religion, Pennywise, and some band from the UK I'd never heard of called Stiff Little Fingers, and uh, it was an awesome show. I had a lot of whiskey last night, met a lot of gay, uh, met a lot of people interested in Gay Dixie, so hopefully we have some new listeners this week. And, yeah, so this is basically uh, my birthday wrap-up show. Everything uh, has been done. The candles have been blown out. I've had all the drinks I'm going to have. Now it's time to celebrate uh, other people's birthdays, I guess. Anyway, um, so I just wanted to start out this week kind of giving a review of the show I went and saw last night. It was at the Masquerade Music Park here in Atlanta. Um, It was basically your uh, classic awesome punk rock show. I mean... All the bands there have been touring forever. I mean, uh, Bad Religion's been playing music since before I was born, and they still rock the show. I mean, they're, everybody there is pretty much older guys now. Some of the, uh, it's like, kind of like the punk rock version of the Rolling Stones watching Stiff Little Fingers. Their guitarists looked a little Keith Richards-like. But uh, they rock the house, man. Um, like I said, I'd never heard of this band, the Stiff Little Fingers, before, um, until now. And they're from the U.K., and they really, uh, I don't know, It's kind of an old-school, very, very uh, jam-centric punk rock set. And then they were followed by Pennywise, who they made me laugh my ass off throughout the show. Uh, They were very funny guys, very entertaining. And I do have to say, one thing about the Pennywise set, and I'm going to interject a little bit of news here for the minute, one part of the Pennywise set that did upset me a little bit was... uh, so they, they gave a shout-out to this guy, Jay Adams, who just passed away, and they played a whole song uh, in his honor. And I, frankly, I had to turn my back to that whole song because, um, you know, if you haven't heard of Jay Adams, he was a, he's a skateboarding icon. He's one of the uh, Dogtown and the Z-Boys. You know, he was made famous, uh, well, r- famous to a whole new generation through that documentary, and then they made the movie Lords of Dogtown. And uh, he was portrayed by Emil Hirsch, one of my favorite actors, And so this guy, uh, Jay Adams, he passed away from a heart attack recently. And um, so the skateboarding community has been all idolizing him and talking about how legendary he is. And I read a Vice.com article that really made me think about it. And I didn't even know this, but uh, the name of the article is Maybe We Shouldn't Be So Quick to Idolize a Gay Bashing Skateboarder. And I'm going to give credit where credit's due. This article is by Jonathan Smith over at Vice. And uh, he basically talked about how while this guy defined skateboarding, what it is today, and kind of made uh, m- made skateboarding more household, you know, more known, it, he, he kind of took it from being almost like dancing and ballerina-like, you know, according to the article, he says he kind of made it more aggressive, and the skateboarding we know today. And so, you know, we can all appreciate somebody who contributed to an art form or to a sport and made it what it is, but you also have to look at the personal background of this guy. And Jay Adams was uh, implicated, and he was part of a 1982 gay bashing, you know. And uh, somebody died because of this. So he was basically part of a murder. Never really went to, uh, you know, he never was charged with murder. He was, uh, what is it? He served six months in prison for it. And so um, I just think, for me, I just personally could not sit there and enjoy a song idolizing him because I think a lot of people even in the punk rock community probably don't know that about him and for me I just had to kind of take a stand there and turn my back to the concert for a minute and kind of zone out even though I enjoyed the whole rest of Pennywise's set and you know their, their show was great I just think uh, maybe not everybody's so educated about Jay Adams and I'm not saying it should affect his legacy in regards to skateboarding but as a person, maybe we shouldn't be calling him a legend or someone we should look up to as as a person, you know. But, uh, so aside from that, Pennywise was great. And then uh, on to the main event, which for me, uh, I love both Bad Religion and Offspring, and Bad Religion was just amazing to see. They rocked the house. You know, their, their lead singer looks a little bit like, uh, I was talking to one of my friends there, uh, and I said, you know, he looks a little bit like Dr. Drew from, the, from uh, Love Line and the celebrity rehab shows. He's kind of gotten older looking. The, the hair's gray, and it's not quite there anymore. But uh, they still know how to play their asses off. They still really know how to get a mosh pit going. And uh, it was a blast. I 
crowd surfed a few times during Bad Religion. It was amazing. It was uh, almost religious, uh, ironically, <laughs> almost a religious experience. And then uh, came the headliners, The Offspring, who they were celebrating uh, the anniversary of their release of their like their album that put them on the map, uh, the album Smash. So they played pretty much that entire album. And, and then a few other songs, too. It was great. I mean, uh, I, I just said, I've never seen them live. I'd seen Bad Religion in the past. I'd seen all these other bands other than, you know, the Stiff Little Fingers in the past. I'd never seen The Offspring, and it was a awesome, awesome show. And, of course, by the time The Offspring hit the stage, I'd had so many birthday shots of whiskey because, you know, it was my birthday, so people decided to buy me drinks, and I get up to the bar, and one of my friends is buying me a shot, and he said, you know, it's his birthday, and so naturally, two or three other people who were standing at the bar were like, oh, it's his birthday. Well, let me buy him a shot, too. So I was pretty hammered by the time The Offspring hit the stage, but I still had a blast. I still went out there and moshed. I got stepped on a few times. Luckily, everybody, you know, luckily everybody observed the rules of the mosh pit road. You know, when you fall down, pick the guy back up, because otherwise I'd have been trampled by... Uh, there, were a lot of, there were a lot of big guys. You know, there was a guy who was wearing a kilt whose, I swear to God, his thighs were as big around as my head... I was like, oh, that's the guy I don't want to mosh with right now because he'll crush me. He looked about like Big Van Vader from the WWE. And uh, so <laughs> so one of the things I wanted to talk about in regards to this concert, it's been a while since I've been to a show, and if you can't tell by my voice, I'm very, very, like, up right now. Like, I'm super, super hyper. And this is not even, you know, this is less than 24 hours later. And um, I was talking to my brother, Butt Mullet, about why I like going to rock shows and what makes rock and roll shows so cool and fun. And, and uh, of course, there's the communal experience. You know, you're there with a thousand other people who like the same music as you and who dress the same as you. And you maybe feel like they're different and you're different, so we're kind of a community. That's one of the things I love about rock and roll and punk rock in general, especially. And, uh, but the other thing about it is, is, like, rock and roll, when I go to a show, I go out there... And I mosh, and I and I dance, and I move, and it basically gets all of the negativity, man, like just right out of your body, like it pushes it right out. It's like therapeutic. It is a religious experience, and it's the only thing. Uh, the way I told him to my brother was, rock and roll is the only place where when you go to a show, you dance around and thrash around, and you come back completely sweaty and disgusting, smelling of body odor, but you feel cleaner than you have in years. Like that's the feeling I get from going to a rock and roll show and that's how you know a show is good. When you afterwards your ears are ringing, your voice is a little hoarse from screaming all night and uh but you feel purified. Like that's what makes rock and roll rock and roll. And I I think I'm correct in that. I hope everybody I hope everybody agrees with that. Like that's just, just that's just me in my viewpoint. Um so the other thing I did this week for my birthday is I had a nice, lovely barbecue at my house. I love to entertain. And so I had some friends over. And uh, my roommate, God bless him, he's uh, a lifesaver because he cooked all the food. Usually I do the cooking, or help with the cooking at least. And uh, because I was working, he was nice enough to do it for me. So we had two lovely racks of ribs. They were amazing, like fall off the bone cooked for hours and hours and hours. Yeah, there's pictures on my Facebook. If, you, if you're friends with me on Facebook, check them out. It, it'll make your mouth water just looking at them. And so we had a lovely barbecue with friends, and we also watched WWE SummerSlam, which for me was, you know, it's like the second or biggest, second or third biggest WWE event of the year. And it was the day after my birthday, so I was looking forward to it, and it, it definitely delivered. The entire show was great. I do have to say... Um, it was great seeing Dolph Ziggler, you know, starting to get a push in that company. He's a fantastic worker. He, you know, he is, uh, he's pretty much anything. He's kind of like a modern day Ric Flair. Like the guy can work and it's good to see that the company is finally having some faith in him. And, uh, I, I look to see, you know, more good things coming from Dolph Ziggler. The other great match was, uh, the lumberjack match, which if you're not familiar with a lumberjack match, it's basically a wrestling match where, uh, around the outside of the ring are a bunch of other wrestlers, and their job is if you get thrown out of the ring or try to escape from the ring, their job is to throw you back in, and it's basically to make sure that you can't go anywhere, you know. Well, this lumberjack match, it was between uh, Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose. Um, it tore the house down. I mean, of course, it didn't quite stay in the ring. It got all over the arena. 
uh, but it's probably the, and I, and I hate to say something is the best or the greatest, but uh, I'm not a big fan of Lumberjack matches, and I have to say, that match uh, really surprised me, and I have to say it's probably the best Lumberjack match that the WWE's ever put on, and which is pretty amazing considering it's usually a very terrible match. So I, I was thoroughly entertained. And of course you had uh, the main event, which was saw John Cena completely getting decimated uh, by Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar going over and becoming the champion. Uh, personally for me, it was a great moment because I, I, I don't hate John Cena. I don't hate the guy. I, he's probably a very nice guy. He does lots of great charity work with Make-A-Wish and whatnot. But uh, I really just don't like... Ever since he's been like the face of WWE, they've gotten so kid friendly and they've moved away from what made them must see TV in the '90s and like it just and and part of it is the Chris Benoit tragedy and Linda McMahon running for the Senate. I mean, I understand why WWE as a c- company toned everything down and it's just I guess John Cena has been kind of the face of that whole thing. You know, he's super kid friendly. He's you know The Rock says he looks like a box of fruity pebbles when he comes to the ring. Uh, and I tend to agree with that, and I'm not a fan of that. So, by proxy, I'm just not a fan of John Cena and his character. So it was great to see um, somebody totally just dominate him in the ring like that. It was a great story that was told. Um, it kind of is ushering in a new era. You know, the WWEs, they've launched their network this year. They're kind of trying to push for a new generation. And I think this is a great step in the right direction. It sends a really clear signal to the fan base that we're not going to be uh, super kid friendly and you know we're going to grow up a little bit as the audience has now started to grow up again so uh, I loved the show it was fantastic and I'm looking forward to uh, a lot more and of course I got the WWE Network it's like $9.99 a month um, instead of paying $60 for maybe that's why the show seems so much better than uh, Summer Slams in the past because I didn't pay $60 for it, so even if there were one or two bad spots in the show, I don't feel like I got cheated out of, you know, a whole lot of money. So, uh, yeah, and that was my birthday week, and I enjoyed it. I hope everybody who was with me enjoyed it. Uh, I know all my friends who are around me, they made it a great time for me, uh, friends and coworkers and everybody who I know. Uh, so anybody who's out there who's listening, thank you for an awesome, uh, for an awesome birthday week. And uh, I want to thank uh, a few of my friends that I saw at the concert last night. I saw my friend Tracy, who, she's awesome. And I met a friend of hers, Christina. She was awesome. And I met my friend Nick, who I hadn't seen since, like, high school, I think, or, you know, shortly thereafter. So it was kind of a blast in the past. So I wanted to give all three of them a shout-out. And, uh, yeah, that was my birthday week. Hey everybody, Chase here, and I wanted to talk to you guys for a minute about uh, my Patreon page and what Patreon is and how you can help uh, the podcast uh, stay free and uh, basically help it grow and do all kinds of new things uh, that will be entertaining for you, the listener. So Patreon is a page. You can get to it by linking uh, at GabeDixie.com. There's a big ad right there for it, so just click on that. It'll take you right where you need to go. And you can pledge monthly to help this podcast out. And uh, pledges start at $2 a month. And, you know, um, each level that you go up gets you more and more um, from us. So, for instance, you know, the $2 level, that gets, you know, a big thank you from us. You know, everybody uh, who pledges $2 a month um, really gets, you know, they get access to a Patreon feed that is uh, only for people who subscribe. And a big juicy thank you from me at Gay Dixie. Now, if you pledge $5 more a month, you'll get a shout-out on the show by name, and you'll get access to solo uh, bonus episodes that I do. And this is kind of a great way, if you don't know me, to get to know me a little bit better. Um, I'll talk about things outside of Gay Dixie that matter to me, and that uh, kind of gives you a little bit more of a glimpse of Chase the person. Now, one level up from that is $10 more a month. And if you donate ten dollars, you know, if you uh, subscribe for ten dollars more a month, you get uh, access to a private Facebook group we're going to put together, and you're kind of joining the team. And you'll have the ability to help uh, create future episodes and future content for episodes, and basically give me things to talk about and broadcast about. So you know, you'll be a part of the team. 
And not only will your $10 a month be going to help us out, it'll be going to uh, help create content for the show. And with that, you'll also get a signed poster from me uh, for Gay Dixie. It'll be, you know, have our logo on it right there, so you can put it on your wall. And uh, you'll be entered to win a quarterly prize pack from me, which will have all kinds of goodies that I find and decide to send to whoever wins. And on top of that, you'll also get access to special video content from GayDixie.com. Um, you know, whatever I happen to decide to film, I'll put out there for you, uh, the listener, to become you, the viewer. And uh, by the way, every level you go, you get what's on that level plus everything that's in the lower level. So the more you give, the more you get. Um, the next level up is $25 or more per month. You'll get a free T-shirt uh, or hat to be determined. We you know, are going to put some merch together, and you'll be the one of the first people to get the merch because you're helping us uh, to create it. So you'll definitely, definitely get it. It'll be something tangible you can have. Um, something else you'll get is a 15-minute personal Skype chat with me. We can talk about anything you want. You know, uh, it just gives me a chance to get to know you guys, the people who are really giving, uh, a little bit better and kind of get some feedback from you guys because that's what I really want. I think podcasts are all about feedback. Now, not only do you get a 15-minute Skype chat with me, but you also get access to a special video podcast that I will do in my underwear. I know I'm selling my body, but that's what you got to do sometimes. And so access to all the underwear video podcasts that I do. Not only that, you'll become a producer on the show, you'll get a credit on the end of the show, and if you own a business or just want to push your Instagram or whatever, we'll give you one free ad per year on Gay Dixie and at GayDixie.com. So, you know, if you give $25 more a month, not only do you help the podcast, but you can help yourself and help your business. Now, $50 a month or more, or more, is our top level. Now, you will get all of the above. All that other stuff I've just been saying for the last three or four minutes. And on top of that, you will get an ad on the Gay Dixie podcast bi-monthly and a regular uh, ad as well on GayDixie.com. And if you want, and if you have a story to tell, we will have you on as a guest uh, appearance, guest co-host on Gay Dixie. So if you really want to tell your story and you know, uh, or want to really push your business, if you own you know, a business that caters to gay people, come on, we'll talk about it for a whole episode, just me and you, just like friends. And uh, so this is all on our Patreon page. And like I said, you can get there by going to GayDixie.com and clicking on the Patreon banner ad. And uh, thank you guys in advance, and anybody who pledges, like I said, you get a big personal thank you from me. All right, Dixieland, I'm back. And uh, now I just wanted to get into a little bit of the news stories that have caught my attention over the last week. And uh, one of them is sports-related. And uh, I don't know if uh, any of y'all know Chris Cluey of the Minnesota Vikings. He was, uh, he was a member of their team, and uh, he's a big supporter of gay rights. And he got fired from the team, or let go from the team, and he said it was because he was so vocal about gay rights that the team let him go because he was too controversial I guess. And so, um, basically, they reached a settlement, him and the team. That's the news story that's broke this week. And I think it just shows what kind of a guy Chris Cluey is when you hear about the, what the settlement was. See, he didn't get any money himself, you know, which kind of sucks for him. I mean, he he's suing because he lost his job, so you'd think he'd want some wages. But what he did is, instead... He is, um, the settlement is going to go towards five gay rights groups, um, an undisclosed, undisclosed sum. I'm sure it's going to be a pretty sizable amount. And it's going to be going towards groups that Chris Cluey, who is a straight guy, by the way, not gay at all, and uh, it's pretty nice to see some straight allies in the NFL uh, standing up for LGBT people. But uh, it's going towards causes that he feels passionate about. So um, I just wanted to say here at Gay Dixie, um, I wanted to give some props to uh, Chris Cluey, um, formerly of the Minnesota Vikings, for uh, kind of standing up for us and, you know, kind of taking it in the pocketbook. You know, he, he lost out on some money because he stood up and said, you know, we need equality in this country, which even today that seems kind of crazy that that would even happen in 2014 or, you know, whatever. But, uh, yeah, so all the love and respect to him, man. Um, another news story that kind of caught my eye this week 
was, uh, so I don't know if y'all remember back uh, a few years back, there was this whole story about uh, this kid, Tyler Clementi, who uh, he jumped off of a bridge. I think that's what happened, right? He jumped off a bridge. Um, and that was, he, he killed himself. And people blamed his roommate, a guy by the name of Darun Ravi, um, who had videotaped him uh, via webcam, I guess, uh, having a gay sexual encounter, and he let other people see it. And apparently this is what the media tried to tell everybody is what caused this guy to jump off a bridge. And the news story this week is that his parents are getting this Gay Pride Award uh, in New Jersey, where Rutgers University is, where you know uh, Tyler Clementi went to as a student before he uh, killed himself. And uh, if you listen to last week's episode, you know I'm not making light of suicide in any way. You know I talked a lot about Robin Williams last week, and uh, you know and about doing what we can to avert suicide, especially in our uh, in the LGBT community. And, but I also feel like it's kind of, I don't think the media is telling the full story when they try to make it seem like this one webcam type deal is what caused this uh, kid to kill himself. You know, um, you, you, usually it's not just one thing that causes somebody to, to commit suicide. It's usually a series of things, um, a series of events or um, depression, things like this that you can kind of see signs of. And apparently nobody saw the signs of this kid, which is a shame. It's a tragedy in itself. But uh, to first off, to blame this other student, uh, Mr. Ravi, you know, um, it's kind of unfair. What he did was wrong. It was very rude and an invasion of privacy for sure. And I wouldn't be happy if he were my roommate. Um, that would have, you know, if I were 18 or 19, that would probably have really, really affected me back then. But not enough to jump off a bridge. And so people have to understand that there were other factors probably in this kid's life that did not get reported by the media because the media, of course, they're interested in telling a quick and easy story that you can digest and just believe whatever they tell you. It's easier for them to control you if the story is simple and not complex. And we have to look at the complexities of the story. And so um, should his parents be really getting an award because their gay son killed himself. I mean, there's a lot of gay kids that kill themselves over the country. You know, they're, not everybody's parents are getting an award for it. You know, and it's kind of a morose, kind of just, it's a morbid. Like, it's just a, is that the word? I don't know. It's, it's just kind of, a, it's kind of a creepy award to be getting. Like, here's this award because your son killed himself. Like, that's kind of weird in its own right. But do these parents really deserve this award? I mean, the kid was only in college for like a year. He was not... You know, he, he had just left home. Who's to say that a lot of the problems that might have contributed to his suicide didn't come from the home? And I'm not saying that they did. And I don't know the kid's parents. I don't know. I never met them. I have no connection to Rutgers University at all. But I'm just saying, I'm putting it out there, that there are other questions that we really haven't asked and that certainly the media had not asked about this story. And now that it's back in, you know, that, that now that there's... Uh, a headline to look into, maybe we should start asking these questions again. But uh, that's just my view on the whole thing. I feel bad for the kid. It was tragic what happened. And, you know, um, it's just another sign that it's kind of hard to be gay sometimes. And, you know, some people take that ultimate choice and it's a bad choice to make. So. So guys, just one thing I wanted to talk about before we go, and uh, this is a trailer I literally just saw minutes ago, and uh, it's for James Franco's new movie that just, uh, it, it premiered at Sundance, and uh, it'll hit theaters in a few days, and it's called Kink, which I feel is, you know, a uh, great name for a movie, and it's kind of coming at the perfect time with Hollywood, you know, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey will be coming out pretty soon. And so, and of course, James Franco, he's always been pushing the sexual envelope. You know, he always loves to tease people with his sexuality and tease sexuality in general. If you haven't seen uh, his kind of, it's, I don't know if it's a documentary or what it really is, uh, Interior Leather Bar, uh, he's kind of gone down this realm a little bit before. And so this documentary is all about uh, 
the San Francisco Armory, which is like the house of kink.com, which is like the world's largest BDSM website. And uh, I understand that's not really for everybody, and that's kind of the whole point. Um, but this documentary kind of just explores the people in the industry and the people, uh, not just the performers on screen, but the people behind the screen, and kind of examines um, what it is about BDSM that uh, turns so many people on and also at the same time freaks so many people out. And it just, it does look like it's a pretty hard, just judging from the trailer, I imagine uh, there will be a lot of squeamish people squirming in their seats when they watch this movie. And uh, I think it's really cool that James Franco is doing this because it kind of gives the movie the gravitas it needs because without a big name, it just kind of, people will just write it off as smut or as like softcore porn or porn. But what it really is, is it's an examination of what turns us on. And uh, I have a lot of friends in the King community, you know, I'm, I've tied people up, not going to lie, <laughs> you know, but uh, I just think, you know, there's definitely different degrees to it, of course. But, uh, yeah, so I just, I think it's a really kind of, a, it looks like a really cool, I have not seen the film, of course, but uh, judging by the trailer and what's been written about it, it seems like a really cool glimpse into that whole world that most of us might not necessarily know anything about. So that's what I always find interesting in a documentary. So it looks like a uh, sexy slash kind of painful in a good way kind of movie. So I encourage anybody to check it out if it hits your local theater. Uh, hopefully it'll hit one or two theaters down here in Atlanta. Um, otherwise I'm going to have to wait for Netflix just like I did for Interior Leather Bar. Anyways... Um, so, that's kind of it for Gay Dixie this week, and, uh, oh yes, one last thing, one final thing. Now, this is just my little PSA to everybody out there, my little public service announcement. Um, election Day is coming up in November, and I know early voting starts in October here in Georgia, and I'm just encouraging everybody who's out there listening right now who's not registered to vote, go ahead and get registered. Um, hopefully you decide to vote in November. And if you do decide to vote, you need to go ahead and be registered. So go ahead and get registered now and uh, really look into, you know, who you want to vote for this November. I'm a libertarian. I know who I'll be voting for this November. But uh, get educated on your candidates and pick somebody because that's kind of your job. And it's the only way we're going to change things. So, everybody, um, that's pretty much it for Gay Dixie this week. Um, this is Chase, and I hope you all have a Gay Dixie week.